passage we're going to be looking at today is from John chapter 16. We're going to be looking at 25 through 33. And the title is Why Faith? And I got a confession to make. I cheated as a dad. Everybody knows one of the most dreaded questions you get out of a kid is why. Because it's not just one question. It's the second question. It's the third question. It's the fourth. Why, 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 why? And it doesn't tend to stop. Unless you're me. Like I said, I cheated. So the first time they'd be told something, you need to do blah. Clean your room. Why? Because if it's a mess, somebody could get hurt and your toys could get broken. First answer, usually about five to ten seconds long. Why? Oh, here it comes. And the next answer I gave was five minutes long. And I'd explain, of course, that you've got to pick up these toys because if I come in in the middle of the night when you've called for daddy or mommy for help because you're having a nightmare or whatever, or you want a drink, and I come into this room and I step on a Lego and I hurt myself, it's going to take me an extra 10 to 15 minutes to calm down. Yada, da, 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 da. They only made the mistake of asking me why a third time on two occasions. The first time they did it, the answer went on for about 15 minutes. The second time they did it, one of them interrupted in the middle of my answer, and I'm a, I was prepared to keep on going. I want to talk now. Are you going to do whatever I asked? Sure. And they start doing whatever. So there's ways around the dreaded why question when it's a little kid. It's different a bit when we're adults. And before going to the why passage, we're going to cover a little bit of the where it was we were. In John chapter 16, we're at a point just before Calvary's cross. Fact is, we're even before the point where Judas actually betrays Christ. They've already done the Lord's Supper. Judas has already gone away. So it's at that in-between time. It's the final hours that Christ has before the trial and the crucifixion. And he's talking with the disciples. And there's an additional bit we need to understand about where they're at. And if we turn to 16, starting back with verse 12, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. He's about to be crucified. There's things he's got to say, but you can't hear it yet. And if we back up farther with verse 4, it says, But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So not only are there things he can't tell them, there's stuff he's going to tell them now that later on it's like, oh, yeah, he did tell us. And they're going to have that aha moment where all of a sudden something that was said falls into the right place. But even backing up all the way to the beginning of this chapter, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Meaning, I'm going to tell you something now that you couldn't handle before. It's about to happen. And so that you get through this, I am telling you this now. So, verse 12 I can't say it right now. You're not ready. Verse 4, I just told you because you're going to need it to get through. You're not going to understand it, but it's coming. Verse 1, I said it so you won't. So you won't stumble. You won't stumble. It'll make sense later. You can't handle it now. This is where they're mentally at. It's that high stress time. They know this. They knew that coming back to Jerusalem potentially meant Jesus' death. Fact is, he's already told them, yes, I'm going to be killed. A lot of stress, a lot of everything going on. Now we're going to jump into the lesson scripture itself. These things, verse 25, I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And my first thought was, whoa, time out. 
I don't remember him doing that. I was thinking through all that I could remember about what takes place after he rises from the dead and before he ascends into heaven. I'm thinking to myself, nah, I'm not remembering this at all. And okay, second confession of this sermon, I've got one gospel weak point. That gospel weak point is Luke. When it comes to the gospels, Matthew, I know pretty well because Matthew is the one that ties into the Old Testament really, really tightly. And the better you understand Matthew and how it tied into the Old Testament, the easier it is to understand the Old Testament in the light of Christ. So Matthew, I got a pretty good handle on. Mark. Mark is my go-to gospel when it comes to evangelism. Because Mark is one of those jump-off point kind of outlines. It's a bare-bones gospel. It's pretty much bullet point, bullet point, bullet point with no extra burden to it. So if somebody wants to ask a question, boom, there's the bullet point. They don't have to be intimidated by the extra stuff tied into the Old Testament. Instead, it just says it. Somebody can ask a question. You can jump off to any place you need to from Mark as an outline. John. John's another one. It's got extra baggage to it. It's the one that's trying to communicate to those who are Christians who might need a little bit of extra because their faith is wavering, might need a little bit of extra because they're struggling with different issues. John is working with those who have a religious understanding and are able to work with the things presented, but need that extra bit of, okay, I'm telling you because, almost the answer to the why question. And then there's Acts. I mean, I'm sorry, not Acts, Romans. Paul comes out and calls Romans his gospel to the Church of Rome. So, Romans has its own special place. It defines a lot of things that if you didn't know the Old Testament and don't want the burden of the Old Testament, you can go to Romans and find the example of what was sin. What is God's grace? And Paul spells it out in a different way than Matthew does. So all those gospel accounts I'm good on. That leaves Luke out in the cold. <laughs> because for me, Luke never quite had the purpose that each of the other accounts did. So I'll read through the Bible, but I'm going to study Matthew, I'm going to study Mark, I'm going to study John, I'm going to study Romans, because I put all of those to use a lot. My weak point is Luke. So of course the answer to my, but he didn't, oh yes he did, comes from Luke. And my first thought was, instead of even thinking about Luke, I thought about Acts. And if you jump to the very beginning of Acts, he does say a little bit. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all the things that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after, he suffered, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Doesn't say that he gave them the extra. It almost sounds like, and he just reiterated things that they already had because he'd already spoken to them about the kingdom of God. So I'm like, uh, somebody actually even told me, oh yeah, Rich, he does, he does. It's just covered there in Acts. And I'm thinking, no, no, it's not covered in Acts. Acts doesn't give me the answer to what he said he was going to do in John. So because I couldn't find my specific, I'm still asking my why question. So I started digging and I go through the first account. The first thing that takes place as far as Jesus interacting with anyone after his crucifixion is when he encounters Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. We see that in Matthew 28, 9 through 10, in Mark 16, 9 through 11, and in Luke 24, 6 through 9. And just to briefly read a little bit of that, we'll look at Luke's account. And that's in chapter 24, 6 through 9. Um, we'll look at verses 7 and 8. And that says, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. 
and they remembered his words. So Jesus came right out and said, this is what was supposed to happen. And then they remembered, oh yeah, you said this less than a week ago. And it did happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm right here standing here. Even though they were standing with him, talking to him, recognizing who he was, it hadn't clicked yet. He had to remind them, I told you, destroy this body, and in three days, I'll restore it. They thought he was talking about the temple because that's where he was standing at the time. Destroy this temple, and I'm going to rebuild it in three days. And they were thinking, oh, yeah, he's going to tear down the law. He's going to, and they came up with a bunch of excuses as to what they, not meaning Mary and Mary, but what the Pharisees and Sadducees wanted to put on it for what he was saying. But the truth was, he was giving them the straight up. You are going to destroy this body. You are going to crucify me, and in three days I'll rise. So this was one of those they did know. Like I said with the very start of the passage, with John 16, there was going to be some things that they knew that weren't going to click. And then they were. So here's an example of the clicking that came on later. So those three passages were a remembrance point because, yeah, he did tell us. The next encounter is with the two disciples and we have that in Mark 16, 12 through 13, and in Luke 24, 13 through 31, and that's a long one. We'll go ahead and stick with Luke. One, because I don't have to turn pages, but two, it has some more interesting information. So looking at 25 through 27, it says, then he said to them, and this is after he's already been talking to them a bit, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So you've got two disciples. They're leaving. They're heading to Emmaus. And it's a seven-mile journey. So that means they had a decent amount of time to be talking. And they're complaining about all the stuff that had gone on. And they thought this was the Christ. This was the one. And now he's not bringing back to their remembrance his words. He's bringing back to their remembrance all of Scripture, going back to Moses, teaching through a vast portion of the New Testament. I mean, Old Testament, because he had the time. <laughs> it's a healthy walk they're going on. Things that they knew but didn't really know. They had taught it, or been taught it, had thought they understood it, but really hadn't gotten it until the moment it was actually fulfilled. And in case you're wondering, well, how can that be? All you have to do is think about marriage. <laughs> Before marriage, oh, you know exactly what it's gonna be like. Once you're inside of marriage, oh, you so weren't ready for any of this. It's like being a parent. You thought you knew what it was going to be like raising a kid and your kids were going to be perfect. And oh, it so wasn't. It happens totally different than what you expect. Even though you were told, oh, there are going to be days. Oh, not with me. I, I, I'm better than that. <laughs> oh, you are so not ready for parenting. Um, but yeah, we can be told things and think we've got it. But until reality hits us in the face good and hard, sometimes it's just really hard to come to grips with it. And a big part of what he was probably talking about is Isaiah. For the people at that time, Isaiah was the most confusing book. Because you had in it the triumphant king. Oh yeah, we're looking for a David. Somebody that's going to kick out Rome. And you had the suffering servant. Ugh. Suffering servant. No, we do too much suffering under places like Rome. We don't want to be like that. And they weren't sure if the king and the suffering servant were the same person. They could easily identify both separately because they could relate to both. 
They could relate to the idea of David the king. They could relate to suffering under somebody else's rule and being their servants and slaves. And that does go all the way back to Moses when they were in Egypt, under the bondage of Egypt and being set free. What Christ was talking, under the bondage of sin, being set free. There was a lot he had been teaching them that was Old Testament. In fact, is all of what he taught them prior to Calvary was rooted in the Old Testament. But with his death on Calvary's cross, they were now sitting in a new perspective. They could not only hear what they already knew, it was that aha moment, and I wish I could put that light bulb above my head, (laughs) where I get it now. So, like he said, there's going to be some things I'm telling you now, you won't get until later, And some things, you're just going to have to hold on to it. This is one of the things they've been holding on to a long time before they got it. So they knew it, but they didn't understood it. And then there's the part of what I missed. And the part that I missed is when he is there with them again, and it's with all the disciples save Thomas and the first time he's there with all the disciples I mean all the apostles except for Thomas John's account I knew John's account in verse let's see chapter 20 verse 19 says wrong page Then the same day at evening, so day-wise, we're talking about the day he rose. First thing that happens that day is when he meets Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Later on that day, as some disciples are finally leaving because they've given up, he meets them, talks with two of them. That evening, we're still on that same day, is when he meets with all those that were assembled. And... Let's look at Luke, because Luke has the real interesting stuff. So it's in Luke chapter 24. The verses we're going to look at, verses 37 and 38. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Mary Magdalene and Mary have already seen him. Fact is, they go running back to this very group and tell them, we've seen the Lord. And now, who's there? The Lord. Why are they surprised? He gives the answer, because they doubted. They were afraid of what they saw. Because even though they knew, because the women had come back and told them, he said he was going to rise, he did rise. They had the answer, and yet with him standing in their presence, it was an answer they still couldn't accept. Just like we saw back in the earlier part of John 16. You can't hear it now. Even in the presence of the Lord, they couldn't still accept it. So again, we're seeing more of what was in 16 played out even after his resurrection. The big oops for my part comes in verses 44, though, through 45. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. That's the fulfillment that I did not realize was there. That's the verse that because I was comfortable in my knowledge of what I thought I knew and understood, I'd missed. Just like they were comfortable in what they thought they should know and yet still missed. Sometimes the reason we ask the question why is because we're not comfortable with the answer. And 
We're going to look at farther down in chapter 20, verses 26. I'm sorry, I jumped books on this. In John chapter 20, verses 26 through 29, this is when Jesus appears later and Thomas is present. 26, it says, And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas was one of the 12. Thomas was one of the 12 who was sent out and when sent out, cast out demons, healed those who were sick, came back to Jesus and said, even the demons obey us in your name. He had performed miracles by power of God. He had direct experience in the things we don't experience. And yet, he couldn't believe Christ had raised from the dead. I have to see it. I have to put my finger in the hole. I have to put my hand in the side before I'm going to believe it's really him. And he's really raised from the dead. And he gets that experience. I was like, oh yeah, I believe now. Blessed are those who won't see and will still believe. We tend to think about believing because we've got a reason to. Thomas was looking for that hard concrete reason to believe. And yet Thomas was ignoring all the reasons to believe that he'd been given before the moment he was told, oh yeah, he said it, he did it. That's not enough for me. You healed people by the power of God and what God said is not enough for you. That borders lines on not just scary, but out and out terrifying. Because essentially Thomas was willing to say, I don't care what I did. I don't care what he said until I get it my way. It's not enough. That's borderlining on not faith. It's borderlining on I don't know what. But do you realize how scary that is as far as trying to convince somebody of the truth? And we're in the perfect season for that. Wear the mask. <laughs> I don't need to wear the mask. And okay, I'm not trying to get into that argument here. I'm just saying, they say, wear the mask for your sake and for the sake of others. I don't care. For your sake and for the sake of others. What does I don't care sound like? Not very loving. Self-important. Whole lot of other things. And again, I'm not making a judgment call here. I happen to be in the camp of wearing masks isn't as important as they say it is. Based on science. But, out of respect for everybody. Out of respect for the government and what they've said to do. I'm so wearing the mask every place I'm told to wear the mask. Because, one, if it keeps everybody here healthy, I'm so good with that. If it keeps me healthy, I'm so good with that. We need to realize, though, I don't have to watch somebody die from it before I'm putting on the mask. I have the understanding that, yes, there is the potential this is worthwhile. I'm going to do it. Thomas wasn't going to do it until he saw the person die in front of him before he was like, well, maybe. Here's Jesus right in front of you, hole in his hand, hole in his side. Oh yeah, now I finally can believe. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, which I read beforehand, talked about what our faith is. 
Our faith is built on evidence that gives us the reason to be able to be confident and believe. Jesus said it. Okay, yeah, I sort of like Jesus. I can sort of believe it. Jesus said it, and God attested to his authority to say it by miracles. He healed, he raised people from the dead, he fed people from food that just wasn't there. Oh, now it's more than just him saying it, it's him saying it backed by the power of God. Did anybody that he spoke to see heaven when he was speaking to them? Not a one. Did any of them see hell? Not a one. Could they see and understand in the physical balance sin in their lives? It's a concept. Nope, can't see that either. He gave them explanations that agreed with the scripture they already professed to believe. He reasoned with them in a way that Paul and Romans will point to scripture some but we'll also point to the simple logic of you do wrong, you know it. You do wrong because it's been done to you. You really, really know it. God gave witness through the Old Testament. God gave witness to the rightness of what Christ said. Did Thomas really have a reason to doubt then? If evidence isn't enough, what are we doing here? Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard said, believing in God requires thinking, I'm sorry, taking a blind leap of faith. I disagree with him. Kierkegaard wasn't some psychological kind of person. He was actually a theologian. And his answer was still, it takes a blind leap of faith. That's like saying, unless you show me George Washington physically in the presence, I'm not gonna believe the guy ever existed. And you go, what? That's crazy talk. We can see it all around us. We've got his picture on our money. We got pictures of him in different other places where they painted of him. They've got all these things in the history book. What are you talking about? You've got to see him to believe him. Well, it didn't happen in my lifetime. You can't show me him. I don't believe he ever existed. And yeah, okay, we got some wackos in society that, yeah, history doesn't exist. It doesn't have reason to be able to believe it because I can't see it now. And I said wackos because I meant it. If there is reasonable evidence for something, reasonable evidence, then there's reason to believe. Faith in God isn't blind. It's based on things we can reason through and say amen to after hearing them. God gave us the Old Testament to show his love, to show consequence for sin, not by just him saying, okay, you all are gonna have to do the 40 years in the desert, but by actually seeing they lived the sinful life, there was consequences in that life for it. We need to be acting reasonable because God has given us reasonable evidence for why we can believe in him. The why faith is because he answers the question of why. It's not raising the question of why should we even have faith. There are things we're willing to do in this life based on a whole lot less evidence than what God provides us through scripture based on less evidence than the evidence we see in our own lives of the rightness of what God taught. 
if we're willing to do far more with far less, why won't we do what's reasonable relative to God? Soren Kierkegaard didn't get that point. He still believed. He still believed that something written a thousand plus years before he was born could be true. Not just that it could be true, that when he examined it, he found truths he couldn't deny. He just didn't realize at the time that truths you can't deny are evidence. And based on a reasonable body of evidence, there is reason to believe. John 16, and I'm going to close it out here. The ending of the chapter that we were looking at to begin with sets the stage for what is coming next. With verses 31 to 33, it says, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Where are they? Just outside of Calvary. He's telling them, you're going to leave me. You're all going to be scattered in different directions. You're going to run. I'm telling you this now because I care. I'm telling you this now because while you're not going to understand it, when I die, in dying without sin, I have overcome sin 100%. I have made the sacrifice as one who qualifies to be able to make that sacrifice. And in rising on the third day, as I told you I will, I am overcoming death and showing you who has dominion over life and death. You have a reason to continue in my word even when you first think it has all fallen apart. The answer to why faith is because it is faith based on biblical terms. And when I say that, it's based on evidence. It's not a blind faith. It's a truth we can be comfortable and confident in acting on, not just on Sunday morning, but in every day of our lives. Because who's the one that gave it to us? God. For God so loved. It's where we're at. It's where we need to be at.